se me cansen, no se me cansen. No se me cansen. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Item number 7A is a de novo hearing for a Coastal Development Permit Amendment originally approved by Monterey County. The Commission found substantial issue in August of last year and that continued the de novo phase of the hearing, which we are holding today. The amendment applies to the Moro Coho Affordable Housing Subdivision in North Monterey County, pictured here. Slide two, please. The location of the Moro Coho subdivision is circled in red on slide two. As you can see, the subdivision is approximately three and a half miles inland from the Moss Landing coast and two and a half miles north of the city of Castroville in rural North Monterey County. Slide three, please. Monterey County originally approved the subdivision in 1995. It provided for 175 single family homes 90 multifamily units and related improvements, all shown within the red circle on slide three. Pursuant to the CDP, and as a result of subsequent litigation, all of these units are required to be affordable to very low, low, and moderate income families in perpetuity. This proposed, proposed amendment before you today would change the length of the affordability term from permanent to 20 years from the date of first deed conveyance, which, because most of the deeds were conveyed in 2000, would eliminate the affordability condition by 2020. To be clear, the proposed amendment only applies to 161 of the 175 single family homes and does not apply to the 90 multifamily units. Thus, it is applicable to just over 60% of the units involved. Slide four, please. To understand the proposal today, it is important to provide some context. After the county approved the subdivision in 1995 and the commission declined to take jurisdiction over the project on appeal, the county and the applicant, Community Housing Improvement Systems and Planning Association, or CHISPA, were sued over the CDP. That lawsuit ended when the parties entered into a settlement agreement where the parties agreed that the affordability requirement was to be interpreted as a permanent affordability restriction. However, the agreement also stated that conditions could be modified upon a showing of substantial evidence in support of the modification. In other words, although the county's original approval of the CDP did not specify the length of the affordability condition, the settlement requires the county to interpret the requirement to be in perpetuity unless subsequently modified for good reason. The county found that good reason and modified the affordability term as allowed by the settlement, and that is the action before you today. To satisfy the original condition, Chispa recorded a deed restriction stating that all units must be affordable to very low, low, and moderate income households in perpetuity. The restriction caps the price at which homes can be sold and requires the homes to be sold to income qualified individuals. Resale prices are currently capped at approximately $290,000 for a three bedroom home, compared to the market rate average of about $345,000 for this area, a difference of just over $50,000. Slide five, please. 
To construct the project, Chispa recruited income qualified families to participate in the USDA's mutual self help program. Under the program, groups of families, such as the one shown here on slide five, spent 40 hours a week per family for a year building their homes. The equivalent of a full time construction job atop the individual's normal work schedules. Approximately 65% of the construction was performed by the families, with more technical construction components completed by Chispa's contractors. In return for their labor, program participants were able to purchase the resultant new homes at cost, which was below market value due to participant labor and grant funding. The monetary difference between the market rate and the actual purchase price is known as sweat equity. In terms of financing, USDA provided families 33-year fixed rate mortgage loans between $100,000 and $120,000 at around 8.5% interest. Although actual monthly payments can be reduced by federal subsidies based on income. Interest rates can be as low as 1% for qualified individuals, and homeowners never pay more than 24% of their monthly income. Chispa placed second mortgages on the home based on the difference between the appraised market value and the USDA loan. These second mortgage loans, which Chispa calls excess equity loans, were between thirty dollars and $35,000 and are unique among self-help housing programs. Under the terms of this loan, no principal payments were due for the first 10 years. After the first 10 years, 10% 10 of the principal is forgiven each year, such that the entire note is forgiven after 20 years. In subsequent years, some homeowners participated in cash-out refinancing based on the market rate of their home and encumbered their properties with debt greater than the actual value, given that the deed restriction limits the resale price. In 2009, a group of homeowners sued Chispa for a failure to disclose the affordability deed restriction and tried to invalidate the permanent requirement. Ultimately, the court upheld the validity of the deed restriction. Chispa subsequently applied to the county to modify the affordability term for about 60% of the units that the county approved, which was appealed to the commission. That brings us to the current proposal, which again is to reduce the length of the affordability requirement to 20 years from the date of the first deed conveyance, or roughly 2020. The question before the commission under the LCP is whether the amendment Changing the affordability, affordability term adequately protects existing affordable housing opportunities and whether the change is consistent with the requirements associated with conversion of affordable units, as described in detail in the staff report. In our view, the particular facts of this, of this situation illustrate why the affordability term of this CDP can be understood in the context of an unusual affordable housing dilemma, and thus removal of the affordability term can be deemed consistent with the LCP, despite different interpretations of the LCP that might warrant a contrary result. First, the settlement agreement language that interpreted the term to be in perpetuity also expressly states that the term can be modified if supported by substantial evidence. The applicant and the county agree that substantial evidence has been shown in this case, and thus have changed the duration. In addition, as described earlier, this particular subdivision was built with sweat equity, whereby families contributed a year of full-time labor to the construction of their own homes, covering about two-thirds of the actual construction involved, which is not typically how affordable housing projects are financed or constructed. This was not an inclusionary housing project that was built as mitigation for a higher cost project. Rather, this was an affordable housing development that was conceived, developed, and built by Chispa 
a nonprofit affordable housing developer. According to the applicant, other such sweat equity projects generally have some time delimited period during which the affordable, affordable restriction adheres, currently a minimum of 15 years. Had a term of 15 years been applied at the time of this CDP approval, the restriction would have expired in 2015. Next slide, please. Thus, in this case, removing the affordability requirement for this particular affordable housing subdivision, which was built by a nonprofit developer with the sweat equity of the homeowners that would be consistent with the manner other similar sweat equity projects are conditioned, this would not allow for other dissimilar inclusionary housing projects to remove their affordability restrictions without appropriate mitigation. Staff therefore believes that this project can be found consistent with the intent of the county's LCP, and we recommend that the commission approve the CDP subject to the recommended conditions. The motion is found on page six of the staff report. This concludes staff's presentation. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Health Commission. Um, my name is Alfred Jason Plante, I'm the president of CFG Stuff. Just one slight correction, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Sabina Lopez, who is now the executive director of the Center of Community Advocacy, and he will follow me. First of all, I want to thank your staff for working with the families to schedule this item locally so that they could attend this public hearing. We want to also thank your staff for the in-depth research on this matter, recommending approval of modifying the term of affordability as approved by the County of Monterey. Chiefs is a community-based nonprofit organization from Salinas. Our mission is to improve people's lives and create healthy neighborhoods. Since 1980, we have built over 2,300 affordable apartments and single-family homes for low-income families and seniors. Not only do we build affordable housing, but we're also involved in advocating for policies that advance affordable housing at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level. We have operated the Mutual self help Program for the past 25 years and have built over 600 homes under this program. The self help Program is a very unique program in which families dedicate 11 to 12 months to build each other's homes. They do this after work and on weekends. It's the family's contributions towards the construction of their homes or sweat equity is what makes them affordable. That's the bulk of the subsidy. The state recognizes that this is a very unique program and only requires a term of affordability of 15 years for self-help housing under the state redevelopment laws. We did our research and we did not find any other self-help housing subdivision that has a deed restriction in perpetuity. This was confirmed by the California Coalition of Rural Housing one of the oldest and largest state low-income housing coalitions in the country. We've developed hundreds of self-help homes throughout the Salinas Valley that do not have any resale restrictions. A study we conducted of these homes shows that 90% of the homeowners still live in their homes. In summary, families build their homes to live in and not to make profits. Rancho Moro was developed in 1989 through 2000, as mentioned by uh, your staff, consists of a total of 265 units, 175, 100% built through South Help, and those are homes in the 90 apartments. All the homes were built under the Self Help program, as Brian mentioned, it's funded by USDA, and it's designed to provide homeownership opportunities for home buyers that do not have a down payment. Their down payment is provided through the participation and construction of each other's homes. As I mentioned earlier, the bulk of the subsidy was provided by the families through the sweat equity and not by the county or other sources. The single family homes were made affordable through the homeowner's sweat equity and the low interest rate loans provided by USDA. In 1989 through 2000, conventional mortgage rates were seven to eight percent. At that time, uh, the highest interest rate under the USDA program was about six to seven percent. And one thing it's important to comment is that USDA will recapture any interest rate subsidy upon the sale of the home or the sale of the home is refinanced or that mortgage is refinanced. Homeowners pay property taxes, a mortgage, and home insurance like every other homeowner. Homeowners pay for repairs like all other homeowners. 
and the County of Monterey provided very limited subsidies for Rancho Moro Coco. The county's financial contribution for Rancho Moro Coco was only 1.7% of the total cost it took to develop the entire subdivision, or about $2,900 per unit. I want to make sure you capture that. It's $2,900 per unit of subsidy provided by the county, very limited amount. The subsidy came from the, from the family's sweat equity. So I think it only makes sense that any condition that's placed on this with respect to affordability is commensurate with the financial assistance that was received by the families. The resale restriction was not a result of the county's inclusionary housing ordinance that was pointed out by Mr. O'Neill. It was not a county policy. It was a result of a lawsuit brought upon by a neighborhood group that opposed affordable housing. This is the same group that is appealing the county's decision to the Coast Commission. On February 9, 1995, the Coast Commission voted to deny the appeal and determined that this appeal did not raise a substantial issue. The settlement agreement that created the deed restriction in perpetuity was put in place after the Coast Commission had denied the appeal. The property was zoned and designated by the county as residential. The condition was not put in place in order to accommodate the affordable housing. It was a result of NIMBYs, people who didn't want affordable housing in their neighborhood. The 90 apartment units within Rancho Moro Coho are owned and managed by Chispa. The request to remove or re re modify the resale deed restriction does not apply to the 90 rental units. As a result, 34% of the housing units in Rancho Moro Coho will remain affordable in perpetuity. The agreement governing the subdivision gives Chispa the right to request the change of this condition on behalf of the homeowners. The two, 2010 County General Plan Policy LU 2.12 supports the modification of this condition. This policy stipulates that for sale housing units with affordability restrictions shall be consistent with the term of affordability provisions in state redevelopment law, which is 15 years. <coughs> Chief was a vocal and staunch advocate for affordable housing and understands the importance of affordable housing. Chief would never make a request that would diminish our efforts to advance affordable housing. <coughs> In fact, Chispa owns a 44-acre property nearby and has submitted an application to the county to build more affordable housing. In addition to this, we have other affordable housing that's in our pipeline within the area. The county of Monterey has an aggressive policy to produce more affordable housing for local families. When the county voted to modify the term of affordability, it identified over 500 affordable units that will be built nearby in the next five years. Homeownership is different than rental housing. Homeowners, especially homeowners who built their homes, deserve the rights and benefits as homeowners. They are not asking for anything special. On the contrary, they are asking to be treated like everyone else who built their home under the South Health Program. Local elected officials responsible for land use and housing policy support the 161 families and ask that you remove this unfair and inequitable restriction. These are local elected officials that have a long history of supporting affordable housing in our community. Bishop Richard Garcia, one of the most respected faith leaders and champions of social justice, recognizes the injustice of the deed restriction in perpetuity and supports the modification of this condition. And now I'm going to show you a few pictures to demonstrate the kind of work that families made in building their own homes. And hopefully you can see that in your small screens. More than 65% of the work is done by families. They do all the framing, the more skilled work like electrical, plumbing, and sheetrock is done by contractors that Chispa hires. These are all pictures of families, these are not the contractors, these are the families building their homes. They do all the interior work as well, with the exception of putting up the sheetrock. All the finished work is done by the families. And as we were doing the construction, we asked at the time Bishop Sylvester Ryan and other faith leaders to bless the subdivision, to bless the work the families were doing because of the hatred and the opposition that the families faced prior to starting their work. And here are two of our families 
to receiving their peace for their homes, the Pena family and the Rodriguez family. And this is an illustration of perpetuity, what it means. My staff put these two illustrations together. Oftentimes we get calls from lenders or others who want to understand what does perpetuity mean? The first one, if you recall, the cartoons of the Jacksons shows that as written, the more code restriction will still be in place. But we all have flying cards. That's what perpetuity means. It never ends. The other picture is, or cartoon is of the um, Sphinx and Giza, who's been interviewed. And it says, so where do you see yourself in 5,000 years? And we added, or my staff added, and I'm not sure when I'll, where I will be professionally, but I know there will still be a restriction on my home. We respectfully ask that you support your staff's recommendation and approve the modification of the deed restriction as approved by the County of Monterey, which is a term of 20 years. And now I'm going to turn the balance of the time to Mr. Sabina Lopez, the Executive Director of the Center for Media Advocacy. Uh, buenas tardes, comisionados. Uh, mi nombre es Sabina Lopez. Uh, I want to try to speak in English. And now my, I was born and raised in high school, working in the field of 20 years. And, Doing advocacy for more affordable housing for many years, and I uh, now I'm an interim executive director for CCA Center for Community Advocacy. Uh, our executive director uh, is retired, so he's not here anymore. So I'm helping the, this transition time, but uh, CCA is now private group dedicated to promote and improve affordable housing in Monterey County, Pajarowari housing since 1990. And I've been working here supporting affordable house for many years. And this only, this case brings a lot of memories in myself, very sad memory. When we were struggling with the families to approve this project, it was really sad. One of those same people here against this action, they were against us. Let me tell you, they're here of families. They're kids, these to be kids, now they're older. They went to school, they went to university. They went to testify and ask the supervisor to prove this project. And those hearings, planning commission hearings, board supervisor hearings at night, late evenings, to, till 11, 12 o'clock at night. And they were defending the rights to have an opportunity to have a decent cause. And those hearings were insulted. A lot of people there were to have very well letters of two types. Discriminatory comments, our family families, the other uh, criminal, criminal, criminals, the drug dealers who want to divide the properties. All those neighbors around there organized against this project, plus Lake Watch, plus other groups like they've been opposed now. There's so many that are opposed now, but I still some of you. But it's really sad to see them coming again to keep this group of families. And, and, uh, and, and one position treated with uh, in, in inequality because most of the families who live in the same private, they have, uh, they have their own deal, and after 20 years they're free to have their own homes, they can be the real owners. So for me to see this again, you know, this is really sad. Finally, when they approve it, we were celebrating. The Bishop was really strong helping us, you know, because they were again attacking this prayer this prayer all the time. But finally we prevailed. And then also we went to the uh, those families there here actually they were starting to be approved, they went to the Coastal Commission to Santa Barbara. It's a bunch of people went there to speak out in this group I know you were there most time, but uh, the commissioners approved it too. After the board supervisor approved it and then they approved this project and now we're here to they accepted that restriction of perpetuity because at least we're going to have the chance to build those homes. Without, without doing that, maybe they, they wouldn't have lived here, but, uh, but also wasn't a win to them, you know, to come back and, and present their the situations and ask the county and other supervisors and ask you to, to remove those restrictions. I think so. The opposition, they say, all you want to know affordable housing. They speak like they're the champions of affordable housing. Come on, let me watch. You're not affordable housing support. I see it across news. Every time you, you do something, you get a post. See what happened in the last little 
they were forced to. You know, they the same, they do the same thing, they use in the environment to not to start those affordable housing for our families. So work in the fields hard. They are coming here to ask him for ten dollars. They're coming here to request the right. Because at what point it's kind of a we feel discriminated, do it different. It's still a big sector, like when it has their own homes and after 20 years they're they're free. Their freedom. Now we they want to retain us, you know, like uh, punishment. Okay, you won't but you still gonna be suffering the consequences to be like uh, rebellious, I don't know, rebels. And then uh, it's not fair. I think so, yes, only thing they're asking is to be treated equally, like anybody else, another party the same. They're not asking for a special uh, support. They're only asking their rights and to be respected equally, we do the same like anybody else, living the same kind of project. So my request is please support your personal staff that recommended that, that we move that restriction. Please support the board supervisor request. Please support all the the you letting you receive for all the money for Salinas Valley. It's something weird. The Salinas Valley here is elected officials and the, actually the, not only Latinos are supporting them to remove this restriction. Then a few guys from Monterey Valley that live in really really mad and everything else is great, they want them to be removed this restriction. Please follow the recommendation of staff, follow the board supervisors, and follow the request for all the families here. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Vice Chair and Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Jane Parker. I'm a Monterey County Supervisor. When this issue came before the Board of Supervisors in January 2016, I voted against removing the affordable housing restrictions. I've come here today to articulate the reasons for my vote, since those details are not in the record before you. I've been a champion of affordable housing for years before and since assuming office in 2009. It's no secret that there is a critical shortage of affordable housing in Monterey County, particularly on the coast. There are fewer state and federal dollars available to assist with this problem, and the problem grows exponentially every year. <coughs> uh, our homeless population, uh, well, let me see, um, well over 50% of the jobs in our county pay less than 30 thousand dollars a year, nowhere close to a living wage. Our homeless population on the coast is in the thousands. We have people camping in all the nooks and crannies that you can find, sleeping in their cars on streets, and people staying with friends, families, and kind strangers while they try to find housing. We cannot afford to lose a single unit of affordable housing. The land use plan for North County clearly requires us to protect existing affordable housing opportunities in the North County coastal area from loss due to deterioration, conversion, or any other reason. Let me repeat that, any other reason. So it's not a question of the definition of conversion as is suggested in your staff report, either on the question of protection or the requirement for one-for-one -for -one replacement. I am very sympathetic to the emotional aspect of ownership in Laurel Coho, uh, but there is no evidence of people losing their home because of the affordability restriction. Um, unlike so many who did lose their homes in recent years due to market volatility and shady loan practices, there is no substantial evidence being presented that would warrant lifting affordability that was agreed to by Chispa years ago. A few key points in the county's record, but unfortunately not in yours. As I understand it, the land sold to develop the Morocco project was offered at less than market value and deed restricted for low income ownership. Sweat equity was one but only one kind of investment in bringing these affordable ownership opportunities into being. Monterey County financed the loans that were made to these residents through home self-help and first home buyer, first time home buyer programs at a 3% interest rate for 20 years. So if someone has a higher interest rate, it's because they have refinanced and used their home as an ATM. In addition, after the 10th year of the loans, 10% of the principal is forgiven each year with the final 10% forgiven in the 20th year of the loan. Also, Monterey County waived nearly $120,000 in processing fees and contributed nearly $500,000 of CDBG funds. These are all very favorable, ter favorable terms and conditions thanks to taxpayer dollars because of the priority the county and the state place on affordable housing. Those public funds were not dedicated to this project so that one wave of low-income households could benefit 
with no ability for the next wave or the next one. Thank you to afford home ownership. Good morning. I guess good afternoon. Uh, uh, John Phillips, I'm the county supervisor from the North County area, uh, and uh, I live about two and a half miles from this, uh, where I have for 45 years uh, from this area. And it was very contentious. A lot of our neighbors didn't want to have affordable housing in our area. Uh, we see a little of that coming back uh, again. Um, the restriction to perpetuity, is, as I mentioned, is very, very rare. Uh, usually you see it, if anything, at 15 years. This is a result, as I mentioned, of a lawsuit. And it really, you look at this project and these people, the sweat equity that they put into this project, uh, we found that there was substantial ed evidence to justify us uh, uh, taking out the perpetuity and replacing it with a 20 year. You know, I was a judge for a lot of years, and to me, this just isn't fair and equitable, uh, and it denies these people the equal protection that we're also benefit. They can't benefit like the rest of us from their labor, from their investment they put in their houses later on, and the rise of inflation. And for most of us, our home is our biggest community asset that we'll ever have. And these people just don't get the same benefits as the rest of us. And there were a lot of financial hardships that were unintended. They can't refinance a home at the lower interest rates like, like the rest of us. They can't get the equity uh, lines of credit. The houses need repair and maintenance after 20 years, and they can't afford those. Uh, because of the value of the house, we do see some deterioration of the neighborhood because they just can't afford to do it with, with the value of the house of staying the same. For many of them, with the inflation in the area, removing of the restrictions is necessary for them to allow in their homes, especially those who are approaching retirement. And what do you do about passing along that home to your children if they don't qualify? And what about the assisted living facility that you may have to go into? What do you do with the house then? And what if you need ADA improvements? Uh, it's just not fair. And we talk about replacement of workforce housing. That's the number one priority of Monterey County. And just looking at what we've done recently, Tamara and Anil have had, uh, I think, for 800 people. That Pebble Beach has a, a component of affordable housing. Chispa, as mentioned, by Alfred as a project uh, right near this one uh, in, the, in, the, in the pipeline. The Housing Authority is working on two projects in Casterville. Ocean Mist has a project in the, in the pipeline. So does Nunez Company, and so does Chula. Uh, those are the replacements that we're getting for affordable housing. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Madam Chair and Commissioners, I'm Vice Chair of Monterey County Board of Supervisors, Luis Alejo who uh, our board had previously supported the perpetuity modification by a 4 one vote based on substantial evidence. As a former state assembly member and as a proud uh, former chair of the California Latino Legislative Caucus and the chairman of the Assembly Environmental Safety and Toxic Materials Committee, I'm uh, proud to be here in support of these hardworking families who have come before you today and who want to express their voice in support of this modification. As a new supervisor, we strongly support um, the uh, affordability, restriction modification, sunsetting uh, after at least 20 years. And here in Monterey County, we're very proud to represent one of the most beautiful coastlines and one of the richest agricultural areas in the world. But we have communities that are very affluent and we have communities that are very disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged. And the issue today before you is one of social and economic justice for some of our poorest residents, our poorest families, many who are Latino, who are immigrant, and work in the agricultural and hospitality industries. As a sweat equity or self-help housing project, they built these homes with their own hands and those of their own family members, over 60% of the labor in each of these homes. They did that sacrifice, they did the hard work to realize their American dream of owning their own home, something that is impossible for so many other families on the Central Coast. However, the restriction in perpetuity makes it difficult to refinance their homes, to do improvements, and to be able to have their own families keep these homes in the future. As we mentioned earlier, um, their children won't be able to inherit their homes unless they are also in that low-income bracket as their parents. Similar sweat equity projects have typically only had these affordability restrictions for 15 and 20 years, not in perpetuity. That's what we're asking for today, just doing what is typically done in similar comparable projects. These families want to keep their homes, 
and he built them. They have their fondest memories with their families in these homes, and they want to certainly keep that American dream that they worked so hard to, to realize. As was stated by my colleague, here in Monterey County, we're on the lead of partnering with affordable housing partners like Chispa to build more affordable housing projects. We recently created the first ever um, affordable housing trust fund in Monterey County, and we were certainly partners with many other local <coughs> governments and uh, nonprofit uh, partners. Um, as was mentioned, we also have um, the most, probably the most affordable housing for farm workers taking place um, than anywhere else in California, perhaps anywhere else in the country, a deep commitment by our agricultural leaders to provide housing for their own workforce. So we have some exciting things going on here in Monterey County. But when it comes to social and economic justice on this issue, for these hard counties, we ask you to support uh, the position taken by the Board of Supervisors and, and what they're urging to do today. Uh, I thank you for, for your uh, attention. Good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Jane Haynes. My signature is on the stipulated judgment that Chispa and Monterey County agreed to in 1995, making 175 rural coho homes permanently affordable. I was told to have my packets on. They look like this. They have a red tab here. Um, and I want you to have them so you can follow along as I refer to enlarged duplications of the pages in that packet. The packet makes two points. Point number one. Please don't get too close to the mic. Okay. Now, point number one, the standard of review for TISPA's application is the certified North Monterey County, thank you, is certified North Monterey County local coastal plan. It requires permanent affordability. The LUP states Monterey County must protect all affordable housing from loss due to any reason. The Coastal Implementation Plan contains the same requirement. Point two. Your staff report lacks financial information necessary for an informed decision. It states, it states in footnotes 8 and 15, quote, Chispa has not provided detailed information on how many homeowners pay the full interest rate or receive federal subsidies, end quote. See in your packet, this 2015 email from Monterey County's then housing officer, Um, it states that a moral coho home was recently sold for $87,000 more than its purchase price, yet the owner received a net of $110,000 because of the forgivable loans. She called it incredible housing, uh, incredible financing. Here's the... Uh, okay, there's the 110,000 and the incredible financing is in there. Uh, see also this interview published two days ago for a Morocco uh, interviewing of a Morocco family who paid $125,000 for their home. They could sell that home today for $290,000, which is $165,000 profit. I provide this information because it's not included in your staff report. Please do not allow emotional testimony to substitute for facts. Replacing 161 affordable homes at a cost of $300,000 is a $48 million decision. 
and <coughs> not protecting affordable homes at Mora Coho violates the North Monterey County local <coughs> coastal plan. Please vote for Land Watch's substitute motion. Uh, so good morning, uh, commissioners. My name is Michael Delapa. I'm the executive director of Land Watch Monterey County. Pr prior to joining Land Watch, I served as the interim executive director of the California Ocean Science Trust, and much prior to that as an analyst with the Coastal Commission. It's great to be back in front of you today. Founded in 1997, Land Watch Monterey County is a nonprofit land conservation and planning organization representing more than a thousand Monterey County residents. Providing affordable housing for local working families within mixed income neighborhoods is one of the five fundamental planning principles that guide our advocacy. Landwatch was a staunch proponent of Tana and Murrow's Tanamura and Antle's farm worker housing project and Pebble Beach's inclusionary um, workforce housing project despite strong neighborhood objections to both. We have also opposed developments in Carmel Valley that do not meet Monterey County's affordable housing requirements. Indeed, Landwatch's interest in Moro Coho stems from our commitment to preventing further loss of an exceedingly small stock of permanently affordable homes throughout Monterey County. I would direct you to the letter that I submitted in support of uh, our position, but I'm here today to urge you to deny the request as your staff proposes to change the affordable affordability requirements and ask them to uh, and vote to explore a potential compromise between Monterey County, Chiefsa, Landwatch, and Jane Haynes as a substitute motion which I have provided. I believe there is a middle ground here. Uh, it doesn't need to be all or nothing. So on behalf of Landwatch, our members, and future generations of low-income workers who will lose the opportunity for housing if these are converted <clears throat> to market rate, I urge you to adopt the substitute motion. Good afternoon, Chair Turnbull Sanders and Commissioners. My name is Tom Ward. I'm a board member of Land Watch. I'm also a full-time resident of Pebble Beach and fully supported the affordable housing that's being built there right now and that will remain affordable in perpetuity. With regard to the affordable requirements for Moho Co Moro Coho, the record is clear. The homes were sold with deed restrictions requiring that they remain permanently affordable. The LCP requires replacement of existing affordable housing lost due to conversion. Notwithstanding the Coastal Commission staff's argument that conversion somehow doesn't include the sale of a home to market rate buyers. As your staff notes, there is a lot of unanswered questions, and I quote, CHISPA has not provided detailed information on how many homeowners pay the full interest rate or receive federal subsidies. I also note that commissioners expressly stated a need at the August 2016 substantial hearing that they need specific numbers about how many homeowners have been unable to refinance. The staff report does not include that information. Monterey County Housing Authority Committee found that 41 homeowners have successfully refinanced their homes. We also don't know how much profits uh, homeowners have made on selling under the existing permanent deed restriction because neither the staff report or CHISPA have provided the data, <coughs> nor what the projection, projected profits uh, of sales are today. Finally, and most importantly, what happens to the next generation of low-income workers? Where do they live once Moro Coro becomes a market rate development? Thank you. Thank you. Hello, commissioners. My name is Judy Karras. I live in Monterey. And I, I know that some good will come out of whatever decision you make today because either it will be a decision to keep the uh, Moro Coho properties uh, affordable or it will benefit those people who have lived there and worked there. So there will be some good come out of it, and I don't know what side. Uh, you know, I, I am in the middle right now, but I want to first thank uh, Chief Spock because I think it's been a wonderful group and I don't like being on the opposing side. My father, Sam Karras, represented District 5 in Monterey County from 1984 to 1996, and he was at one time a member of the California Coastal Commission. 
he worked very closely with Chista, and he totally supported affordable housing, uh, housing for farm workers, um, and I also in great support for um, that housing and, and, and recognition for the work that farm workers do in our area that is often, often overlooked. Um, my father was a very fair-minded person. He sought compromise and common ground in negotiating solutions to many problems. And one of these problems is affordable housing. And the highest priority that I heard somebody mention earlier is affordable housing. Market rate housing is not affordable. And once you change these uh, feed, um, well, the prices of housing, then that really creates or contributes to the inflation that was mentioned by Supervisor um, Phillips. So I really am, am encouraging you to put some kind of a middle ground limit placed on the rate of return that if these people are going to get over $100,000 back with the uh, investment already made as been shown in a 2014 study, then um, I, I think that there should be some interim solution that would be beneficial and preserve this uh, lower income and uh, low and moderate income housing there's so little of it in the county. Thank you very much. Hi, Wes White, uh, a resident of Salinas, and uh, I'm I'm in favor of, of changing the or, or going with the application and changing it from uh, the, the restriction to market rate because they, they've already put on sweat equity for over 20 years, or it will be 20 years by that time. And uh, how we how do we expect people to grow if we always keep them stunted? Um, you know, we, we need change the way that we do our developing of, um, you know, our version of what affordable means, um, because it certainly means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, I'm also a, a president of the homeless union here in Salinas, so I, I feel like I, I have some, some weight in this, um, and, and to see people grow and put in the effort, um, <coughs> they, they deserve that kind of reward. Um, because it's just so hard to, to survive the way it is, and, and families grow, um, and to, to leave it stunted as, as these deed restrictions and leave it in per, per, perpetuity, how does that really help the people already in there right now? Um, that, so I, I hope you approve uh, the application to change the deed restrictions. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Ángel Vargas, soy de la Cuatro Ochenta y Dos. Comunidad Way. So my name is Duncan Vargas. I live in uh, 9482 uh, Comunidad Way in Castro. Y mi historia es que cuando comenzamos este trabajo para hacer nuestras casas, yo ya tenía 65 años. My story is when we started to do this process of building these houses, I was already 65 years old. Así que no era nada fácil para mí. It wasn't easy for me. Porque tenía que trabajar. Ocho horas para mantener a mi familia, dos hijas y mi esposa. I needed to work eight hours to take care of my family, my children, my kids. Y después tenía que venir al trabajo que teníamos que dar lo que más pudiéramos y lo hacíamos hasta que el sol terminaba que se metía. And then we would get home from, from work and we'd put our work into the house until the sun went down. Así que cansados pero contentos porque mirábamos que la obra iba creciendo. We we were tired, but we were happy because we, we saw the construction of the house, we saw the house being built. Y lo logramos. Porque, sí, porque el 15 de marzo del 2002, logramos ver nuestros sueños coronados. Porque nos entregaron las llaves y dijeron, esta es su casa. So it was a happy day on the March 15th. Uh, they gave us keys to that house and we were so happy because they said this. This is your house. Pero ahora me pregunto, ¿por qué esa restricción dice que perpetuidad? So, I'm asking, what about this restriction? I ask myself, per perpetual restriction. Yo pienso que mi edad es grande, 80 años en la actualidad. So, you know, I can see I'm getting older, I'm 80 years old. Y el día que falte yo, esas casas, que nosotros podemos decir heredar a nuestros hijos a manos de quien van a parar si esta restricción sigue que es perpetuidad so what I ask myself this is the what I want to give to my children and with this 
type of restrictions, what am I going to do? How am I going to, what, how is it going to be done? Por eso espero que esas personas que se oponen tengan una reflexión y vean que lo que piden es absurdo. Y como estoy seguro que la ley de California es imparcial. I know the laws in California are very impartial. A ustedes, señores del jurado. For you, members of this commission. De parte, están de parte de la justicia. Are you supporting justice? Y espero que su veredicto sea no perpetuidad. Yeah, and I'm hoping you make the decision no perpetual time frame. Gracias. Thank you so much. Very good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christopher Acosta from the community of Morocojo in Castro, California. I am the son of Elena and Mario Acosta. The people who built the home I currently reside in from the ground up. Not to mention, they have also been taking care of our home and paying it for 16 years just to give my siblings and I a roof over our head. I am not only speaking for my family, but rather standing up for my fellow community in Morococo who have been taking care of our neighborhood for well over a decade. Now I have a few simple questions I want to ask everyone in this room. Let's suppose you build a home and you work very hard to pay whatever is necessary to sustain that home, raise a family in that home, and then pay off the mortgage. Wouldn't you consider that home yours? Now. Besides the obvious, besides the obvious, don't you think you should have the right to pass that home down to your children? Now what if you found out you weren't able to? What if you weren't able to pass down your home that you worked so hard for to your children unless they worked at a minimum wage? How does that sound to you? You don't have to be a Nobel Prize winning physicist to realize how socially injustice this is. To my community, this is simply inequity. So to the California Coastal Commission, I ask that you vote in favor of equity and not in favor of an injustice act like perpetuity. Your decision to vote will not only affect the homeowners, but it will affect many fa beautiful families that live in our community. Todas las familias y residentes de Morcojo se pueden parar. All these families and many, many more, your, your decision, you're going to affect these families. So thank you. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre, mi nombre es José Luis Muñoz y soy miembro de la comunidad de Morocojo. My name is José Luis Muñoz. I am a member of the Morocojo community. Yo he trabajado en la agricultura por más de 40 años. Been an ag worker for more than 40 years. Cuando se presentó la oportunidad de participar en el programa de Chispa, pensé que era una muy buena oportunidad. When I had an opportunity to participate in the Chispa program, I thought it was it was a good idea, it was a good opportunity. Para al fin tener una casa propia que que ofrecerles a mis hijos era como un sueño hecho realidad. To have a home that I could I could share with my children was a dream come true. Cuando se me dijo que para poder pertenecer al programa de vivienda, al uh, programa de vivienda, de, de, de trabajar 40 horas por semana entre mi esposa y yo, mm -hmm. en la construcción. When I started, they informed us that we would have to put in uh, 40 hours of work uh, to build our home. Sabíamos que era muy pesado. Sin embargo, mi esposa y yo teníamos que mantener nuestros trabajos, ya que de ellos dependía la mantención de nuestros hijos. We knew it was going to be tough because my wife and I. We knew it was going to be tough because my wife and I knew that we would have to maintain our work, our work schedule, and then come and work on our on our project. 
and that's you know we we need to we need to feed our children. Hicimos arreglos en nuestros lugares de trabajo para el turno de noche y así poder cumplir con los requisitos del programa. So we spoke with our employers and we adjusted our work schedule to to work nights. That way we could we could uh, work on our on the on the criteria of the, of the program. En el trabajo los turnos son de 12 de 12 horas, 6 días y los domingos 8 horas de manera que durante el tiempo que duró la construcción mi esposa y yo estuvimos trabajando dos, dos trabajos. So, you know, my work schedule is six days a week. They're 12 hour days. On Sundays, I work eight hours. That's what I had to do to maintain. Con, con la ilusión de tener una casa propia para nuestros hijos. Always holding the dream of having a home for our children. Con todo este esfuerzo, logramos que todos nuestros hijos fueran a la universidad. With this dream, we were able to, to have our children all attend the university. Y se graduaron, cuatro de ellos son maestros, y los otros dos tienen otros trabajos. So four of them became teachers. And two of my other children have other type of work. Ahora nos enteramos después de tanto esfuerzo de, de ellos y de nosotros, de nuestros hijos, no van a, a poder heredar la casa. Now I know with all this hard work we put in, now we've, real, we've, we've realized that our children are not going to be able to inherit our, our, our home. Hello, uh, my name is Jose Carpio. And uh, I want to talk to you about, about the, the restriction. Um, it's kind of unfair. Everyone knows that. Um, people uh, were expecting to own the house. And with it, it came the responsibilities of owning a house, also the, the rights. But in this case, some of the rights are being denied. Uh, at this point, the houses are getting old. It's uh, about 20 years. The roofs are uh, beginning to show signs of deterioration. And um, like the LCP mentions that uh, the, it has to be protected against any loss of uh, affordable housing due to deterioration, uh, change, uh, con conversion, and uh, by not letting the, the, the people uh, have the market value, uh, people will not be able to, uh, to fix the houses. Uh, be because uh, on the first place, to be able to qualify to own the, these houses, people are low income uh, earners. So they don't have the money to actually put in to replace the, the roofs. So they need to finance. Banks, they don't, they don't want to mess with uh, this people from this project to provide uh, money to, to fix the houses because there is such a restriction. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, uh, the LCP mentions that any loss due to deterioration goes against it. Uh, so, so that that's something to consider. Also, in the first place, the houses will not be converted to market rate because they were to begin with. Good afternoon. My name is Carlos Abi. I'm also Monterey County Planning Commissioner of District Two, and uh, I'm just gonna have to repeat pretty much everything you said, but it's worth repeating. I fully support, obviously, the residents of Moro Coco. And I, I sometimes they refer to them as glorified renters because they can never be owners when they have all these restrictions. Yet, we require them to maintain it, pay taxes, pay everything like any other homeowner would. 
yet with the time comes, they cannot even pass it on to their children. And all of us strive, I know I have, I've got four daughters, and we want our daughters to, our sons to progress, uh, have, have a better life. And for each of the residents and parents feel the same way. So one of the, uh, it's been said before, one of the children becomes a, a medical doctor. Yet the home he was raised in, he can no longer inherit it. It's great he's a, he's a doctor, but he can afford something else, but that's not the idea. He was raised in that home. But that is his home. And, um, so obviously, I fully support this group. I know it's, it's been said, and it's going to be said again, uh, they are owners, and let's treat them as owners. The restrictions should not have been put on in the first place. Uh, or within 50, excuse me, within 15 years. Now it's 20 years with some, some modifications, but nevertheless, I fully support staffs, and I do hope for you re remove these uh, restrictions that they might, opinion is unjustified, and sh they should be given the same rights that every, every other homeowner has. Thank you. Uh, good evening. <coughs> my name is Mario Costa. I'm living in Monaco. Uh, I want to make my testimony really short. Uh, I'm on the member of the Morocco Home Board, so we work on the community for keep a nice community, nice houses. We have beautiful neighborhoods, so we want to keep the Morocco Home in good conditions, clean, so please help us. We are agree of 20 years is good enough. We know sometimes uh, we need some kind of rules but uh, we agree 20 years is good enough. So please help us. Thank you. So is that one of the biggest you even rent more poco? Well, uh, señores comisionados, solo una persona es la que se opone a quitar la perpetuidad. There's only one person that's opposing taking this perpetual issue away. Esa persona es la misma que estuvo en contra que se construyera estas casas. The same person that was against building this house, housing community. Ella está en contra de las familias de Rancho Morocojo. She is against the family of the Rancho Morocojo. Y quiere seguir perjudicándolas ahora. She wants to continue to damage us. Ahora ella quiere es que la que está pidiendo que primero se construyan otras 165 casas. Como condición para liberarlas de Morocojo. Señores comisionados, las familias y yo esperamos su voto a favor de quitar la perpetuidad. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Mi nombre es Marta Rodríguez y vivo en Rancho Morococo. My name is Marta Rodríguez and I live in Rancho Morococo. Me dirijo a ustedes a Comisión Costal de California. I'm addressing you the California Coastal Commission. Me imagino que cada uno de ustedes tiene su casa. I imagine that each one of you owns a home. Y si sus casas necesitan reparaciones, ustedes invierten porque saben que sus casas van a ser más valiosas. Uh, if your homes need repairs, I imagine that you invest in those repairs because you know that your homes will become more valuable that way. Las personas, las casas de Rancho Morococo ya tienen 16 años y pronto los techos van a necesitar reparaciones. The homes in Morococo are already 16 years old. Soon the roofs will need repair. Y las familias van a tener que invertir, pero la inversión de las familias no tendrá el mismo valor que su inversión por la cláusula injusta de perpetuidad. The families will have to invest in repairs, but the homes will not have the same value because of that unfair clause of perpetuity. Estamos aquí porque Creemos que no es justo el tener esta perpetuidad. We are here because we do not believe it is fair to have this perpetuity. En las manos de ustedes está el futuro de 161 familias. 
the future of 161 families is in your hands. Ahí vivemos niños, adultos, jóvenes, y ese voto se recordará por mucho tiempo. Children, adults, and teenagers hear their, this vote will be remembered for a long time. Porque ya todos los gobiernos locales y políticos californianos creen que es una injusticia because all local governments as well as California politicians believe it is an injustice. Solo faltan ustedes. Por eso necesitamos su voto a favor de remover la perpetuidad y dejar la restricción a 20 años. Gracias. Your vote is very important. That is why we are requesting that you remove that, this requirement of perpetuity and leave it up to 20 years. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es María Cuella y también vengo de la comunidad de Morocco. Good afternoon, my name is María Cuella. I am also representing the Morococo community. Queremos su apoyo a favor de las 161 familias que sufren una desigualdad llamada perpetuidad. We would like your support on behalf of 161 families who are suffering under this injustice called perpetuity. Es una injusticia. Mire la desigualdad de nosotros. Pagamos impuestos de propiedad como cualquier otro dueño. It is unfair. Look at this uh, inequity. We pay property taxes just like any other homeowner. Incluso un impuesto adicional por un parque y camino cercano a Morococo. Even an additional tax because of a pair and an access road, a park and an access road close to Morococo. Un ejemplo, si el techo de mi casa necesita reparaciones, Yo tengo que reparar como cualquier otro dueño de casa. As an example, if my roof needs repair, I have to pay for that repair just like any other homeowner would do. Cuesta mucho dinero estar invirtiendo dinero en reparaciones, impuestos y nunca ser oficialmente dueño de nuestras casas. It costs a lot of money to invest in repairs and taxes and never officially become owners of our own homes. Esto es una injusta, una injusta perpetuidad. This is an unfair perpetuity. Porque sufrimos de esta discriminación y desigualdad. Because we are suffering from this discrimination and inequality. Otros dueños de casa sí pueden ver el futuro de sus inversiones, pero nosotros no. Other owners of homes can see the future of their investment, but we cannot. Si pagamos las mismas cosas, ¿será que es una injusticia racial? If we are paying the same amounts, is it perhaps a racial injustice? Que nos impusieron porque la mayoría somos latinos. That was imposed on us because most of us are of Latin descent. Esta perpetuidad es inhumana e injusta. This perpetuity is inhumane and unfair. Solo la tiene la comunidad de Moro Cojo. Only the Morococo community has this. No es justo. That is not fair. Háganlo justo. Voten a favor de remover la perpetuidad y modificar la restricción a 20 años. Please do what is fair. Vote in favor of removing the requirement to perpetuity and leave it up to 20 years. Como lo recomienda su personal. As your staff has recommended. Gracias. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Marina Costa. I am the daughter of 200 people who had the opportunity to build and buy a home in the community of Morococo. I am here before you to ask for your support against perpetuity because we have the right to our home. It is true that we pay $30,000 less than the price of the market, but this is because these families have spent valuable time building these homes with their own hands. I clearly remember the day I chose my room. The house was only standing on two by fours, but I had already envisioned how I wanted my furniture organized according to the window and door frames. For over a year, my family did not have any room for quality time. My father would get out of his job and help my mother with our house. And as cliche as it sounds, it did, I did not mind because I knew that our dream of owning a home would become reality. The day we got the keys to our house, the gas was running, and we slept on the floor because we had no mattresses. 
Yet we decided to move in that same day because we had sacrificed so much and were so excited that those things didn't matter to us. Little bit did I know that the room that I dreamed of would not actually belong to me. In that moment, neither I nor my family knew or understood the harm of perpetuity. Now that I'm 24 years old, I understand that perpetuity is a social and racial injustice over our community. I also have invested hard-earned dollars into the home, and I will lose my home because I choose to pursue higher, higher education. It is embarrassing to live in a country of opportunity and live in a home of perpetuity. It is mind-blowing to think that there are people out there wishing this upon families, because apart from race and class, this, got, this not only affects homeowners, but also children, families, and in this case, my community. Elected officials understand the injustice and perpetuity, and your vote should be easy, because the supervisors of our county have, have already decided what is right. Now it is your turn, the California Coastal Commission, to vote for what is right and remove perpetuity over our homes. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, first of all, um, and thank you for the opportunity for, uh, for me to speak today. Um, I am the daughter, uh, my name is Dalila Ponce, and I am the daughter of uh, Mr. Jose and Ms. Maria Ponce from the Moncojo community. Currently, I'm working, I'm working in the agriculture industry, which pertains to my pupil study and career of choice. Just like many, just like many others, my parents immigrated, from, uh, um, immigrated to this country seeking a better future. Deriving from a distinct country, unfamiliar with a culture and language, none, nonetheless, they came with a purpose. Their dream was to give us what they were unable to acquire, the ability to receive an education, have financial stability, and establish ourselves, as well as generations to come. For years, we moved from one place to another, lived with several people at once, and hardly saw my parents. They were constantly absent, working multiple jobs at once, just to make it day by day. What seemed to be a continuous, endless struggle finally came to an end. My parents became homeowners. With their own hands, sweat, and tears, my mother and father built what my sisters and I call a home. Sadly, we came to realize the struggle never ended. Due to the restriction of the perpetuity clause, all the hard work became meaningless. This community of hardworking individuals, just like my parents, found themselves unable to obtain the freedom to pass their legacy as an inheritance to their loved ones because they are low-income homes. Many of us with higher incomes and education will not qualify for one another. Let me ask you something. Why do we have to be oppressed and be denied the ability to be free? Why can't we obtain ownership rights like everybody else? Why are we, why are we the exception? The Morocco community is the only one with this restriction which is unfair and inhumane. Those responsible for the application of these regulations took full advantage of my family's needs and inability to comprehend the harm the perpetuity causes. How will you feel if somebody said no to your family? How will you tell your kids that you cannot grant them that which you worked all your life for? How will you construe your pursuit of happiness when unnoticed in a place where freedom flourishes for everybody except for you and your family? Not easy of it. This, year, this year's long bias and discriminatory constraint needs to end. We deserve equal rights just like all other homeowners. We ask you to remove the perpetuity and modify its 20 years. Due to the fact that we have substantial support from elected officials and other important leaders, if our request is denied, you'd be saying no to a significant mass of people. So please consider the recommendation of the modification and help us bring peace. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon, commissioners. I am Jessica Ponce, and I'm the daughter of Jose and Maria Ponce in the Morocco community. And I ask you to please remove the perpetuity clause. I consider uh, myself a hardworking individual. I am very proud to say my parents became homeowners. My parents, like, like all of them, do want the children to pursue higher education. And most of us did. I became a nurse, and now it plays against me. I am forced to say I will not be able to inherit my parents' home. I don't quite understand the people who are now opposing this modification. When Rancho Morocco was in the first planning stages, these same people and groups opposed the development because it would serve low-income, hard-working families, and now are making this seem like they are defending affordable housing. Why is this? 
The truth is that these people and groups have no connection to the people in the Salinas Valley. They are opposed to farm working families, people of color, and low income families like us. Think about it. They were opposed when Rancho Morococo was planned by taxes when it was approved and did it by filing lawsuits to stop the development. They were opposed when we opened the case at the county to modify the restriction. And now, file this appeal. The attack continues. No matter what we continue to do, they will always continue to attack. It's been like this for almost 20 years, and it has to end here. After all this, we are still standing strong and united, asking for equality. We don't stand alone. We have elected officials, housing advocates, faith-based leaders, and people behind us fighting this structural racism. So now I ask for everybody that took the time off their busy schedule to come to the to please stand. As you can see, this is a representation of people uniting together for multiple homes. We ask that you vote today and accept your staff's recommendation to remove the perpetuity and modify it to 20 years. Thank you. My English is not really good, but I want to try. Uh, good afternoon, members of the Coastal Commission. My name is Leticia Enriquez, and I have lived in Morococo for more than 15 years. Just like all the families here today, our areas, I am here to ask you to remove the perpetuity clause from the deeds of our homes. The decision to remove the perpetuity and modify the restriction to 20 years has already been approved being forced by the Housing Planning Commission and the Monterey County Board and the Supervisors. Me and everyone here present are trusting you, the Coastal Commission members. We will do what is correct and just by supporting the families of the Morococo. Both in favor of the the removal of the perpetuity cause. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Maria, and I'm here on behalf of my sister Araceli, who wrote the following. I write this letter to obtain your support and vote against perpetuity. I would consider this a fair and just decision. I am a proud daughter of Rosa and Francisco Cuentas, who both, with hard work and sacrifice, along with 160 other families, not only built their own homes, but also developed a community rich in culture. They built a home that unknowingly came with these unjust, inequitable restrictions in perpetuity. It is not fair or just to place a restriction of this nature on homeowners, like my parents who built their own homes. It is not fair or just to place a restriction of this nature on homeowners who pay property taxes, just like any other homeowner. It is not fair or just to place a restriction of this nature on homeowners who have all responsibilities as any other homeowner but can't see the equity of their, of their American dream. This perpetuity is inhuman, unjust, inequitable, and discriminatory. At the age of nine years old, I witnessed hard work and sacrifice from all these families. But with this perpetuity, it seems like time, effort, work, and investment resulted in nothing. I witnessed the two people who mean the world to me, put everything aside, their weekends, their health, their families, including their children. Between full-time jobs, which consisted of 72 hours a week, my parents, on top of that, dedicated 40 hours every week to the development of our home. I saw my parents rise as early as 2 a.m. and work seven days a week. In fact, for over a year, I barely saw my parents. And that, that is not fair. It is not fair to discredit so much hard work and sacrifice. It is not fair that in the end of it all, our families cannot call these homes theirs. My parents and everyone else in this room deserve equality, and they deserve it now. Join me, the families of Morococo, many Monterey County leaders, and your staff and vote no perpetuity and change the restrictions to 20 years. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commission. 
My name is Julieta Villa Gomez, and I'm here to present the testimony of my parents, Jose and Rosario Villa Gomez. When we learned of the opportunity to own our home, one that would be built with our own hands, we knew it would take sacrifice, time, and effort, but at the end, it would be worth it. Everything we were doing was for our children. The construction of our home took a year to complete, time during which we both juggled full-time jobs, working five days a week, and spending our weekends dedicated to the construction of our family's future. Today we come to realize that the homes we built, our children's inheritance, is not really ours to inherit because of perpetuity. With all due respect, it seems cruel to discredit all those years of savings, hours of work, and sacrifice family time to building a home we cannot truly call our own. Our daughters have grown to be college students and college graduates, attending community, state, and private institutions of higher learning. Our concern is not that our daughters cannot provide for themselves, rather that we are denied the possibility of one day leaving them the home they grew up in. We ask that you find it in your hearts to vote in favor of the families by approving the modification of the Morocco restrictions to 20 years. Approving this modification grants us the fair equity we seek after many years of struggle. We want to truly be able to call ourselves true homeowners of the homes we built. The same homes we raise our children in. Thank you. Good afternoon, Customers Commissioners. My name is Manuel Resendiz and I live in Comunidad Way. I want to speak to you about the times where we did to build these houses. We we had to work, some of us, even two jobs, and still we had to put those 40 hours to, to build the houses. We did it rain or shine. We had to show up or we don't have to get, or we cannot get the house. The worst happened to us was that we didn't have time to take vacations, but vacations were okay. We didn't have time to spend with friends, that was okay too. It was worse that we have no time to spend with our family, our children. I used to have at least my daughter with my family members and sometimes with other people that I just know, but I had to show up to work or I didn't get the house. Finally, when we get into the house, we found about this nightmare, the prosperity clause. Criminals get prosperity and they get a way to get out of those prosperity eventually. But we are no criminals. We do not deserve this this prosperity on our shoulders. We have we have been having meetings with community members, which include the planning commission, the county supervisors, and after they review our case, they voted to remove this restriction at 20 years. This case is very simple. This is my family's house. I want my child my daughter to inherit it, I want the, her children to inherit it, and so on. Today we are asking you to agree with the planning commission, the county supervisors, and you want staff to remove this restriction at 20 years. Thank you for your time. My name is Martin Marroquín. My name is Martin Marroquín. Uh, vivo en la comunidad de Morococo for 15 years. Y trabajo para el Acuario de Monterrey por 23 años. El Acuario se encarga de conservación del medio ambiente. Y yo estoy, y yo estoy muy de acuerdo a eso y es, y es, la, y es la filosofía. Pero es muy importante. Es muy importante también pensar en la protección de las familias. Es muy importante proteger el agua. Todo es importante para la humanidad. Yo me acuerdo cuando empezamos a construir nuestras viviendas era 
era un, ha sido un gran sacrificio para todas las familias que estamos aquí. It was a huge sacrifice for all the families that are here present. Como bien dice, todo el que sufre es el que siente la verdad del sacrificio. As it is well said, anyone who sacrifices uh, and suffers, they are the ones who feel the truth of the sacrifice. Yo tuve, tuve que cambiar mi sketch en mi trabajo para poder cumplir con 40 horas a la semana. Esa le tenemos un especial cariño a nuestras viviendas. So we have a special kind of love for our homes. Porque, porque nosotros las construimos con nuestro sudor. Cuando me siento a, afuera de mi casa, yo veo el sacrificio grande que cada una de estas familias hicimos para poder tener vivienda. Pero hay una cosa muy importante. Cuando yo renté por 20 años, yo no pagaba los tantos impuestos que pago ahora. Ahora mi casa es mi responsabilidad como de cada familia que estamos aquí. A veces yo me siento que estoy rentando. Y eso no puede ser posible cuando hicimos un gran sacrificio para tener nuestra casa. Yo trabajé en mi primer empleo 12 años en la Alcachofa, en Castroville. Y el sacrificio como yo, como todas las familias que hemos estado aquí, que estamos aquí. Todos son mis amigos, mis vecinos. Y el 90 95% trabajan en la agricultura. Trabajo que es un honor tenerlo porque de ahí mantenemos a nuestra familia. Y así los mercados de la ciudad están abastecidos de verduras, de diferentes frescas verduras para que todos nosotros podamos alimentarnos y volvernos incluso vegetarianos. <risa> Así es que es muy importante que tomemos conciencia, señoras y señores, de esta situación que nosotros estamos viviendo. Quiero informarles que esta quiero informarles que a, usted, a ustedes que la perpetuidad ya ha sido removida a 20 años como ya lo han dicho mis compañeros por la mesa de, super, de supervisores de nuestro condado y de su personal Esperamos a todos, esperamos todas las familias que estamos aquí, las que no han venido por razones de trabajo, que este día, por favor, voten a favor de la recomendación de los, de los directores de la ciudad. Yo tengo ya 73 años, 
háganlo por nuestros hijos, nuestros nietos. Porque a nosotros el futuro nos interesa de todas las familias. Muchas gracias por su atención y espero que sea positivo la presentación que en este día han escuchado. Muchas gracias. That the presentation that you have heard today is useful and important to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, good afternoon. I'm Alfred Diaz Infante, President of CFTSPA. Just a couple of points that I'd like to um, correct in uh, reference to comments made by Supervisor Jane Parker. She mentioned that the land was offered at a reduced price. Uh, the land was um, foreclosed on, and uh, CFTSPA negotiated a good price on the property. Um, I don't think we should be penalized for doing so. Uh, the families, when they purchased the lots, those lots were purchased at market rate prices. Uh, what happens is we go for our development, we uh, put in all the streets, sidewalks, all the infrastructure, water, sewer, and so forth. And then, according to the USDA self-help program, uh, there's an appraiser that gets hired, and then there's an appraisal of that lot. And that lot is appraised at market value. Uh, so the idea that for some reason Chispa received this property reduced price, perhaps Chispa, because of the circumstances, and as a developer, a nonprofit developer, we were able to negotiate a price that made sense for us. But I don't think it should be a reason for penalizing us for the families because we're able to negotiate a good price for that land. But in summary, the families did pay market rate prices for the lots. That's part of the process, part of the program that USDA oversees. And then there was reference to the funding that the County of Monterey provided. Again, I want to emphasize that the amount that was provided by the county represents only 1.7% of the total cost of the development. It's the family's subsidy, the family's contribution of sweat equity that is the significant part of the subsidy. It wasn't the county of Monterey, so I think it's important to point out. And I think those are the only two comments um, that I have in terms of uh, rebuttals. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to check in with our interpreters to see if we need a break um, or if we can go on to the staff report. All right. Moving forward, we'll bring it back to the staff for your response. We just wanted to quickly note, because the commission did request additional individual uh, financial information during the substantial issue portion of the hearing, um, Chisla does not have that information. They don't hold the mortgages, those, uh, so they don't have access to that information. All of those mortgages are held by the USDA. Uh, we contacted the USDA, and they don't retain information on a project level basis. It's uh, retained by individual homeowner, and that's all private financial information. So that's why we, we weren't able to obtain additional financial information. Um, and you know, we heard a lot of testimony today, uh, and it's a very unique situation. And we just want to say that we continue to support the staff recommendation, um, mostly due to the sweat equity factor of it, and we're available for questions. Thank you. Commissioner Bronzi, with respect to um, a question, is it procedure or substantive? Um, okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to call on uh, Commissioner Vargas uh, for the motion, and then we can begin conversation if that's all right. Uh, thank you. Um, I move that the Commission approve Coastal Development Permit Number A-3-MCO-16-0017 pursuant to the staff recommendation. And I strongly recommend the yes vote. Maker, the motion like to speak to your uh, motion and uh, the second year following that. And after that, we'll have uh, Commissioner Ramsey. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Let me start this with uh, some clarification from the staff, if I can. <clears throat> there was discussion about the, uh, hang on a second, let me collect my thoughts here. Um, there was discussion uh, about uh, this perpetuity issue and 
whether it meant, uh, you know, the substantial issue was, the, I guess, I don't know what they call it at the county level, but clearly the county saw that there was substantial evidence to allow this removal to be removed. Can you discuss a little bit more? How did you, when you, when the staff reviewed that process and determined it was sufficient, can you give us a little bit of a, a uh, thinking in terms of what went through staff's mind in terms of Sure, I can start in on that. And I think you're referring to, so the settlement agreement includes the, um, uh, I'll back up. So the settlement agreement has the perpetuity clause and the county's required to interpret condition 99 pursuant to that settlement agreement. And then the settlement agreement itself allows for changes to that provided substantial evidence is shown. And that's the process that Chispa and the homeowners went through with the county. Um, and in our own thought process, which is you know, articulated in the staff report. And I think uh, Mr. O'Neill referred to it in our just closing comments there. It became really um, important. Uh, the sweat equity component of this project uh, became an important uh, part of our analysis, including because in the research we were able to do, we weren't able to find a project like this that had a perpetuity requirement. Um, these were 15, 20 year terms when they were applied. And so in our view, that was, um, you know, substantial evidence with respect to this type of a project, which also distinguished it, and, I, and again, it's articulated in the staff report, distinguished it from other sorts of affordable housing projects, including inclusionary housing projects. Um, so we thought the fact set was pretty unique here, and that's, it's a, it's a big driver in terms of our uh, recommendation. So you, you found it was justifiable to to approve this based on based on the fact that uh, mostly uh, these are short term or, or termed at least and not in perpetuity. Agreed. And in terms of the sweat equity, we also I mean there are some arguments about the conversion um, and um, in terms of the LCP and we did look to the Mellow Act, um, which provides guidance with respect to affordable housing in the coastal zone. Um, that there are arguments there that support um, this not being the type of conversion that the Mellow Act is referring to. Um, so again, there's there's a, a whole series of, of reasons for it, but uh, I do think in large measure, and I think you heard a lot of it today from the testimony, um, it boils down to these folks, uh, you know, put their blood, sweat, and tears into this and their sweat equity. Um, and it's a different kind of project because of that. And again, we didn't find another project that had a perpetuity term Thank you. That, that's very helpful. And, and you know, we're somewhat, uh, this is a, a, an issue that we don't really cover that often because, uh, in general, the Coastal Commission policies don't allow us to look at affordable housing. But I think because the LCP calls specifically for this uh, consideration of affordable housing, we're now thrust into this unique and special issue, which is timely, I think, based on the state, ongoing state debate regarding the affordable housing crisis that we have, in, not just in this region, but statewide. Um, we have, an, it's, a, it's a struggle, and I understand why some are calling to preserve this as affordable housing, because, because there's just such a lack of affordable housing stock out there. Uh, but I don't think that's the right way to move forward with this. I think that, yes, the county, the state, we do have an obligation to continue to create more affordable housing units. And that is definitely what we should be doing. But we shouldn't be penalizing people that have worked very, very hard to build those homes themselves and to get ahead. I think we need to step back from affordable, the idea and the concept of affordable housing and affordable housing policy and think about what the idea and the principles are behind it. It's not, it, it, the idea is to help people get up and move up and help families move up in this world. It's not to lock them into perpetual poverty. It's not to lock them into perpetual caste system of having to depend on affordable housing. It's not to condemn generations of families to not be able to benefit from the fruits of their parents and their ancestors. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Cesar Chavez once said, when the man who feeds the world 
by toiling in the fields, is himself deprived of the basic rights of feeding, sheltering, and caring for his own family. The whole community of man is sick. This is a really important issue for us to consider. I think, um, I think we have an opportunity to really change the lives of a lot of people here. And we, have, we have an opportunity to move, step away from arcane words and legalities and policies and realize that there are real human beings in here <clears throat> that are going to be affected by the policies we make today. And with, you know, I'm gonna, if I'm gonna ask, hopefully that I can speak in Spanish. I know last time I did that, <laughs> I uh, received some flack, but uh, I'm gonna give it a try anyway. Uh, well, I would like to remind you, Commissioner Vargas, that we do have um, uh, interpreters, so we can. Um, I appreciate that, and I'll, so I'll make my comments brief in Spanish, and I will translate them right back so everybody can understand. Uh, are, are you going to do your own translation? Sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to mess up your flow. Yeah. I'm just. <laughs> I will do my own translation. Uh, All right. And I'll start in Spanish and come back in, in English. Para mí esto es, uh, pero primero quiero darle las gracias de la comunidad de Morocojo por venir y para luchar por sus derechos. Eh, esto para mí es un tema principalmente de justicia y que ustedes merecen avanzar y sus familias merecen avanzar. Uh, I was briefly just saying that uh, I want to thank the community for coming. I know they're taking time out of their jobs and their busy lives again today, just much like they did last year. And for me, this is a very simple issue of social justice. And these families deserve an opportunity to move up and to advance. So I'll be supporting this motion. Thank you. And Commissioner Uranga to your second. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I too would like to say a few words in Spanish and kind of, I think we'll translation. Kind of Uh, buenas tardes. Primeramente quiero dar las gracias a todos ustedes por estar aquí hoy en este importante tema que tenemos aquí frente a nosotros. Es uh, una lucha para ustedes, ya se sabe, y nosotros también queremos, nosotros como luchamos para proteger la costa y el mar, también ustedes tienen el derecho para proteger y luchar para mantener sus casas. Y para eso les quiero dar las gracias por ejercer eh, ese esfuerzo de, de competir, de, de, de estar aquí para sus uh, derechos cívicos. Uh, basically, what I'm saying is that I'm thanking them for their participation here today. Uh, and just like we here at the Commission fight for the rights of, of protecting the environment and the ocean, they're here to fight and protect the right to have their homes. And I, I'm thanking them for their civic engagement for being here today. I see this whole uh, in perpetuity uh, conflict that's going on here and bringing here today as, uh, it really as counterintuitive, uh, pretty much the same as, uh, as Commissioner Vargas said, is that you know the whole purpose of home ownership is to advance, not to stay. Uh, the whole purpose of home ownership is to use your home as that equity, whether it's sweat equity or just equity because of time and, and changing uh, housing prices. It, it's, it's about moving and advancing. As a college student, when I was back at Cal State Long Beach, you know, I got out of the barrio, I grew up in the barrio, and when I went to school, it was because I wanted to get educated and I wanted to advance. I wanted to get that opportunity of living the American dream of owning a home and having a family and being able to use that home as my equity to help me advance in my life as I, as I move forward with, with a wife and three kids and two dogs and a fish. <laughs> so when we have that and we have this, this issue here before us today, you know, I know that those are the same dreams that the families that are here in front of Rojo Moro uh, are having today. And, and that's the, 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 the fight that they're fighting for. They're fighting for the same things that I fought for. And even then, when I was in, in college, when there were some individuals and I would go back into the neighborhood and say, you know, you left us and you need to come back. And I said, no, I left you because I needed to advance. I, I needed to go forward with my life and get out of the body and get out of poor housing and get into a, a, a situation where I could provide for my own family and for my own growth and for my own profession. And I know that that's what's taking place here. Uh, the stories that I have read, that I heard today, some of the families, 
of the children going to school that had to and becoming nurses and other professionals and then not having be, not being able to come back home uh, and live in their home and, and, and inherit that home because they lived the American dream because they went to school because they have a profession because they're making money way above poverty level and now they can't live in their own home because of that that makes no sense whatsoever and that's where it is counterintuitive this, that this uh, perpetual uh, in perpetuity uh, uh, notion is, is just counterproductive of, as to why we are here in the first place. You know, in this Coastal Commission over the past few years that I've been here, we have dealt with uh, various you know, the, uh, environmental justice and social justice issues. And this is one of those, where this is a social justice issue that deserves to be uh, addressed for the benefit of the community. We need to have these families whole. We need to make them whole. And that's why I'm going to be uh, supporting the motion. And I hope that my colleagues will as well. Thank you. Commissioner Bronzy. Good afternoon. I feel like the pressure is really on for me to start in Spanish, but I'm going to spare you that. My Spanish is so bad. But I want to thank you so much uh, to the families for coming today and sharing your stories. They are so critical uh, to, to this story that we've been presented with to try to discern uh, what is the right um, solution for your problem, of which I think you're probably everybody up here is very sorry that you and your families have had to struggle with this uh, for these years because Outside of personal family matters, it's, I think, how you feel about your home and your connection to your home is, is so important and to have that be something that was turned into something so stressful. I can't imagine uh, what you have been through. Saying that, I do have a couple questions for the director of CHISPA, if, sir, if you could go to the microphone. Um, and then I think I have a question or two for staff, so I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Onfonte, uh, it's my understanding that the settlement agreement was uh, agreed to with the perpetuity clause in 1995. Was that filed uh, at the clerk's office? Uh, it was a deed restriction on these uh, properties. Did it become a deed restriction at that time? It did it became a deed restriction that was required to be recorded against the properties, all the properties in the Ranch Morco development. So it was recorded as uh, as a restriction on their deed from yes. the beginning. Yes, it was. Now, um, my understanding was that people did not understand that that restriction was on their deed until much later, until after they had um, lived in the property for some time? That's correct. And how did that occur? I'm not sure exactly because I wasn't personally present. Um, this is a, the largest development that our organization, CHIP, has ever developed. So it was a very complex development that uh, required a lot of financing. Um, we rely on our staff to explain um, the full program of USDA, which includes how the mortgage works, how the um, hours that families are required to work um, is scheduled, um, and includes a tremendous amount of paperwork. Um, I think if you just think of your own experience of buying a home, um, it's complicated. Um, so Overly there so. was added a complication because of the financing of USD loans, um, the way the program works, and then explaining um, how these conditions were in place. It was a significant amount of information, I believe, for families and to sort of be able to pinpoint that one issue. I think maybe that's where they, they maybe didn't, they didn't quite grasp that. So are you saying that staff, probably your staff, or the staff, pardon me, the staff probably pointed it out to the 
homeowners, but that they didn't grasp it because from the staff report, my impression was that they were unaware of it, that it had not been communicated to the homeowners. I think part of what happened is that, again, because this is new, we haven't experienced it, we hadn't experienced it, at least my staff had not experienced it, um, we didn't know the full consequences of such a condition. Um, so my staff, and so we said, well, this is what this is what it means, what it says, but it wasn't like this full discussion about what are the consequences, you know, what are the unintended consequences, what's going to happen 10, 15, 20 years from now when um, real life situations come into play, or you want to refinance, or um, a couple go through a divorce. And they want to buy each other out, you know, one of the experiences our homeowners had. Um, we hadn't thought about all these things because this was the only time that we would ever seen like this for both our organization, our staff, and for the families. Mm -hmm. And so this would be the kind of thing that typically banks, uh, when they uh, refinance, would kind of highlight. Um, that the data is kind of inconsistent because both we heard both that people could refinance 41 cases of refinancing versus people couldn't refinance and then that's when people were still unaware of the clause and so got into more debt from financing than the value of the home kind of thing so I, I'm just trying to understand how, how sort of how, from the CHISPA perspective, how, how do you uh, try to explain to the um, families who enroll in this program those, those kinds of elements? Um, we, we have a standard presentation that our staff will make, again, with respect to the loan itself, but it's not CHISPA making the loan, it's USDA, again, how um, the program in terms of the construction works, as well as uh, not just the construction, because um, CHISPA, under the eyes or the term that USDA uses, we are the technical assistant provider. Um, so we have uh, our staff who are providing information in terms of how the program is working, but also the construction, where um, some of the work, as I mentioned earlier, is contracted, uh, where plumbers and electricians are hired and people who paint their drywall are hired. But there's also an explanation of how the financing works. Mm -hmm. Because there's a whole escrow account that's open for each group. Um, the families are split into groups of about 12 to 14 families. And then there's an account for that particular group. Uh, so there, it's, it's complex. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a whole fund for each group. Um, and there's draws that are made from that account for the purchase of materials as a group for purchase, or uh, not purchase, but paid invoices for those contractors that do get hired. Um, and then there's just a lot of information to share with the families. Mm -hmm. I do want to take you back to the early 2000 or so, 2004, 2005. You mentioned there were some refinances. Um, there were banks that weren't even looking at title reports, weren't looking at this. You know, if you may recall back then, when you walked in, you could walk in and yeah, yeah, sign your name right. and you loan. Um, that happened, but once um, the whole uh, crisis hit, the economic crisis and the bank crisis hit, um, banks became more diligent, started reading very carefully all the title reports and conditions that were in place, and that's what's happened to many families who have attempted to refinance. That's become a major issue. Not that the fact that they can't refinance, but that they feel that they're treated so differently after having worked so hard and contributed towards the construction of the home. Right, I, I totally understand that. But would it be fair to say that um, that the families really rely on CHISPA to explain the terms of their mortgage and the terms of the financial relationships that are available to them through these different uh, low income and subsidized programs and to help does just uh, help them under you know advise them in terms of, here are the things you're eligible here are here are the pros and cons to choosing a particular financing package is that something that you do 
and sort of review the, the terms and the restrictions of the payments. <coughs> That's correct. I would take, take that one step further. Not only do they rely on us um, because of our long history regarding affordable housing in Monterey County, the whole Central Coast, um, the families trust us. They trust our name, they trust our organization, they trust the staff. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your answers. I totally appreciate that. I was really, I have to say, very torn on this one because a lot of this didn't make sense to me. And uh, I am sure that CHISPA is, and clearly the work that you do is such important work. But I hope that this experience will kind of put a little bit of a uh, more uh, spotlight on perhaps some additional client services that could be improved so that people would understand um, that the organization would uh, provide more specific information so that the people who enroll in these programs can suffer uh, from a lack of understanding of, of what they're signing on to. I'm going to support this motion uh, because of the particular and specific circumstances around it. But I do hope that we all are able to take some positive away from this, which is to get better consumer information uh, for, for the clients who uh, deserve nothing but the best uh, information in their efforts uh, to uh, support their families, to grow their families, to become uh, viable uh, and uh, just, you know, extraordinary uh, people in, in our uh, communities. And uh, I think you heard me, uh, heard what I'm saying, and I just want to thank you for answering the questions and uh, uh, appreciate uh, to all the families uh, your being here and uh, um, and telling us your stories and your particular circumstances. Thank you, thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Padilla. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot get conscious support the motion. I'd like to speak to my opposition. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the staff, uh, first of all, and all of you who've been so patient and participated. Uh, uh, this is one of those, I can tell you from my own experience, uh, those, those typical, often typical cases, despite the circumstances being atypical, where the commission is confronted with a lot of relevant facts and data that appeal to senses of equity and justice in all of us. And it becomes very easy, very tempting, to incrementally abandon the fact that we are in fact a quasi-judicial body. Uh, that uh, if we don't maintain the integrity of our findings about standards and consistency with prior findings, uh, that we run the risk of really corrupting and um, damaging the integrity of the Coastal Act and what it was designed to do. And sometimes that's very, very hard to do in the face of issues that are fundamentally very emotional and present a lot of very valid arguments on all sides. I appreciate very much the analysis and the staff, uh, the work that the staff has done, but I have to respectfully disagree with the staff's uh, conclusions. I appreciate very much the unique history of this particular project and its development. I have great respect for the work, particularly the unique circumstances where the initial uh, and first buyers and homeowners were people who were also partly developers and built uh, their own homes and put sweat equity into those homes. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that this uh, existing uh, development and inclusionary housing project was approved and designed and then built and further financed as part of a program to provide affordable housing in this location on this site. And to that end, people who did spend time helping to build their homes were given monetary credit and equity in their homes based on their work. They further were able to take advantage of favorable lending circumstances, even for forgivable loans later in the process. Um, 
What I'm thinking about are the future occupants of these homes, whether they be related to many of you here, or they may be the yet unborn children of future families who are going to be in the position you are in now or were in when this project was approved 10 or 20 years from now. Uh, I am thinking about the family that wants to buy a home in this project, in this location, but will not have the advantages of purchasing it with the subsidies and the reduced prices and the advantages that many of you had when you purchased the home. Uh, the reality here is that I think the standard in the certified LCP is the appropriate standard, and I think that it is clear. Uh, I think uh, it's pretty unambiguous, both in terms of the standards language itself, particularly we've had some testimony about that, as well as the implementing ordinances. Um, I don't think that the staff or the commission even needs to reach the analysis of whether or not this is a conversion uh, or to apply the statutory standards that are reflected in Mellow, because the whole purpose of the LCP standard is to maintain, regardless of the reason, uh, the supply and the market of affordable homes in this location. That is the whole point of the reason that that standard was in the certified LCP, because it is related to uh, providing access to coastal communities at a lower cost for people who can't otherwise afford to either buy or spend some time in those locations. And the whole purpose of that policy at the local level is to provide market and product on site for very low, low, low and low moderate income housing. And that program and that policy does not run to any individual, individual person or homeowner or home buyer. The policy runs to the product and the availability of that product on site. That's the whole purpose of an inclusionary housing policy. The fact that the situation is unique uh, is not the issue. The fact that the deed restrictions that you see here are scarce and are infrequent is not the issue, nor is it the standard of review. The standard of review is pretty articulated pretty clearly in the certified LCP. <coughs> And while many of the other sentiments and concerns that have been expressed are all valid, they aren't the standard. And the reality is that um, the settlement agreement, frankly, is not the standard of review either, uh, even though it's relevant. Uh, but what the end result of this application would do would be to remove a stock of affordable housing on site. And that, I cannot agree, is consistent with the LCP standard. And so I will not be supporting the motion. Commissioner Lovano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is definitely one of the more complicated and difficult issues that we've had, I think, ever, at least in my short tenure here on the commission. Um, but certainly this week. And I want to start by saying that I appreciate all of the folks who have spoken today. And uh, my colleague is right that this is an emotional issue. And for those of us who are first or second generation um, and who have had the opportunities that were described here today, I think it is home for us. Um, and, and I will start by saying that I am very strongly leaning um, in in the direction of supporting this motion, um, along with my colleagues over here. Um, but in the same breath, I will say that I have listened to Commissioner Padilla's comments um, and share some of those concerns, and in particular because we do this every single month, and the question that I bring to almost every single commission meeting is, how does this relate to the Coastal Act, and what are we doing to ensure that we um, protect and enforce the Coastal Act. Um, that being said, I, I feel like the staff has, again, done great work and um, identified the part of the Coastal Act on which we can rely in this case, um, 
one of the concerns that I have, and I'm not sure that this can be answered, is in terms of affordability and maintaining affordable housing along the coast. I mean, to be honest, I, I'm not sure that even the price at which um, these folks would be able to sell their house right now, forget market rate, is considered affordable. Um, and I'd also like to know, and I read somewhere in the staff report that the county is taking uh, significant strides to increase affordability in the area, and I wanted to hear a little bit more about that um, to understand exactly what they are doing. I'm not sure who can answer that, either someone from the county or the staff. Well, I think it'd probably be best if uh, a representative of the county, that if they wanted to walk through some of the affordable housing they're doing, but I can. I can tell you our understanding is that there's over 500 units being proposed at the current time. These are generally speaking inland of the coastal zone, um, just so we're, we're clear on that, including the project, the Chispa project that folks referred to earlier. But it'd probably be better if you wanted a, a more detailed explanation of their efforts for the county to speak to it. Yeah, I mean, if we could get a brief explanation from someone from the county, that would be great. I don't know if here. Anyone from the county? Thank you, and if you could state your name for the record, please. Sure, uh, Brandon Swanson, uh, Monterey County Resource Management Agency. Um, actually, our uh, affordable housing person is not here right now, but I can speak to some of the projects that we have in the pipeline from the planning department that I'm aware of. Uh, we have several um, agricultural worker housing projects uh, in the pipeline right now. As staff mentioned, most of those are in the inland area, however, um, but they range anywhere from 80 beds to one that's down the road of north of a thousand beds. So we've got multiple projects uh, spread throughout the county right now that we're in various stages of processing, either in the conceptual stages of working with the applicants to help them design a project that better meets all of our land use policies, all the way to uh, those that are already in application and going through the internal review process and initial study. So that's that's where the county's at right now. We're trying to move any projects that have the capacity to increase affordable housing in the county move those along expeditiously uh, through our process. But uh, off the top of my head, there's at least six projects right now in some form of that, that pipeline process right now. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, and that, I, I'm not sure that that actually addresses the concern that, that, um, uh, that uh, I think council member, but what commissioners, uh, mm -hmm. commissioner of the DRAs, um, and, and I'm still struggling also with the idea that the, uh, you know, that the children of the people who have built this housing um, essentially become ineligible if they step out, you know, of a certain economic or, or, or you know, our council's shaking his head at me. Uh, I. A number of people did make the comment that uh, the children of the current owners would not be eligible uh, to inherit the units uh, if they were no longer earning uh, a lower income. Uh, just from the review of the deed restrictions and also looking at a court of appeal decision, that does not appear to be the case. Uh, several years ago, there was litigation about uh, the validity of this deed restriction. Uh, and one of the arguments in that litigation was that uh, the deed restriction meant that uh, the houses could not be inherited by the children. And the Court of Appeal indicated that it did not see any such restriction in uh, the deed restriction. Uh, and just looking at the wording of the deed restriction, it requires that the units be affordable to lower income houses. It doesn't say that it has to be occupied by any um, lower income household. So it appears to be that that affordability requirement kicks in when the unit is being sold. So it can only be sold to lower income households. But as interpreted by the Court of Appeal decision, it does not appear to be um, something that prohibits a house for being conveyed to the children because there's not a sale that's occurring in that context. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I don't have any further questions right now. Thank you. Commissioner Peskin. 
Thank you, Vice Chair Turnbull Sanders. Uh, first of all, I wanted to um, associate myself with the comments of Commissioner Padilla. Um, and, and while Section 30614, subsection A, does isn't our standard of review is set out in the staff report because it's on the other side of Highway 1, I, I still think that in addition to the very specific language in the LCP, it does give this uh, commission direction. But I had a threshold question relative to the September 22nd, 1997 uh, deed restriction, which is this deed restriction runs with all of the subdivided properties of which there are now 161 individual owners. So I'm having trouble understanding why Chispa is actually the applicant. As a threshold issue, they're no longer in the chain of title. And this deed restriction now runs with 161 pieces of real property. How does somebody who used to be in the chain of title come back 20 years later as the applicant? I guess that's a question to staff and council. Sure. I mean, is this properly before us is what I'm asking? We believe so. Um. <laughs> Uh, Chispa was the original um, applicant for the coastal permit and they still hold some of the loans and the, the county is amending the permit. They chose to go through that process as they were the they were the permit holder and they were the ones eligible to pursue an amendment to their permit. But through the vice chair of the staff, when somebody comes for a CDP, they don't bring their Wells Fargo bank with them as the applicant. I mean, how, how, where, where is a provision in the Act that allows a mortgage holder or a previous holder of an instrument in the chain of title to be the applicant? Uh, well, one, one factual question that staff may be in a better position to answer is whether or not she's the currently owns some of the property within the subdivision. That I, I do not know the answer to that, and uh, perhaps Chisma can address that. Uh, as part of the settlements agreements, um, you know, associated with the original litigation, that provided for a process for making changes to permit conditions relating to the deed restriction. That settlement agreement between the county, Chisma, and others specifically provided the CHISPA would need to be the applicant for changes to the permit conditions for that. So um, I'm assuming that that's at least one of the major reasons why the county accepted an application from CHISPA to amend the county CDP and then it was subsequently appealed to us. Um, so that I think that's one part of the reason and I'm not sure that uh, uh, Either Dan or Chispa has um, additional information on that. Commissioner Peskin, is it your desire to have Chispa respond to that? If or? Chispa would like to respond, I'd be happy to hear it. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Peterson is correct that the reason that Chispa is the applicant is because the settlement agreement required that any change conditions had to be filed by the applicant. And so that's the reason that we apply. And then your other question with respect to the we does Chisa own other properties? We own the two apartment complexes within the Rancho More Co development through um, a limited partnership. Thank you. I will be voting uh, to oppose the motion. Any other commissioners desiring to speak? Commissioner Howell. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, I think uh, Commissioner Padilla's experience uh, shows today. I think that uh, um, yeah, the LCP is very clear about, uh, about the necessity to protect um, uh, low-cost housing. And I really appreciate the comments of, of everyone who came today and their homes. And, uh, and the fact that they, when they went into this project, they did put a great deal of sweat equity into it. Um, but there was also an awful lot of other equity that came from other sources. And you know, these, these programs are designed to give home ownership to people of limited means who might not 
otherwise be able to, to acquire homes. Homes are hard. In California, we, we're barely above the 50% uh, homeowners uh, ownership rate. Um, and I hate, I mean, and I, I don't, I, I, I'm going to vote no uh, based on Commissioner Padilla's uh, argument. But even addressing, you know, the emotional aspect of this and the equity aspect, uh, you built a beautiful community, you built beautiful homes, you raised your kids there, uh, you're successful. Uh, we've heard great stories here today. And um, that's what these programs are designed for. Nobody's saying that you don't own your homes. Uh, the argument here is, do you get to have a windfall profit on the sale of it, or are you limited in the uh, profit you can get on these homes? That's really what we're talking about here, is a limit on the profit of the sale. They can even be rented out, yeah, according to uh, our, our chief counsel, um, that these things go into effect when there's a change in ownership. Um, this is a difficult, a difficult, unique situation, but there are, they, these things are also precedent set statewide. And as the Coastal Commission is asking to have affordable housing brought back under our jurisdiction, I think it's it's a problem as we release 161 um, affordable housing units into the market rate that. Uh, that who knows who purchases them, but I think we can be fairly confident they will not be low-income housing. Commissioner Padilla? Just to perhaps with unanimous consent and the time is right, also as part of this discussion, I think it would be, I'd be personally interested in getting information from our staff and further. The question that Commissioner Peskin asked, the threshold question I was discussing with my colleagues before the hearing went in, privately, and I thought I heard some testimony earlier that tended to answer that, but then on further reflection, you know, I think we maybe would benefit from some analysis as to whether, frankly, I don't know whether the settlement agreement, whether whether the homeowners individually and collectively were parties to that directly or indirectly, and whether the settlement agreement gives the gives CHISPA the, the standing to be the applicant in this case. I think that's an interesting question that's worthy of some some further discussion maybe as applied in other circumstances, but that's a very interesting question uh, that I would like to, to have some more light shed on in, in the future. I will accept for purposes of this record that it is the adequate determination of our staff and our general counsel for purposes of this hearing that in fact they are, they are uh, they do have standing uh, for purposes here, but maybe just a general discussion in the future about what does and doesn't constitute would be beneficial. Commissioner Vargas? Yeah, I'm just wondering, if, well, on that on that note, and maybe the council can uh, comment on it, because I, maybe this is, maybe we should not be moving forward on this and, and either postponing or, or withdrawing and resubmitting the motion. Could you give us a little bit of a, a feedback on uh, Commissioner Padilla's comments? My understanding in the context of this project is I believe that the litigation of the settlement agreements and the recordation of the deed restriction occurred uh, prior to the sale of the individual units. Uh, so I think in that case that then would mean they agreed to it, but the individual owners were just as successors in interest effectively. Uh, with respect to the individual units, so they would be bound by those deed, the deed restriction would apply to that. I'm not sure if I'm missing part of uh, the issue that you raised. I think you covered that. So, okay, well, I, I'm, I'm just seeing how we move forward here, and I have a motion on the table, but I'm also able to hear the testimony of my, or the comments of my colleagues, and I'm able to count, and it seems that uh, we're very, uh, we're looking at a, uh, a, a motion that probably will not pass. So I'm wondering if there's an opportunity to seek uh, a, an amending motion. Uh, if anybody thinks there is a way to uh, salvage this and, and, uh, and, and find a way to modify the staff recommendation in its current uh, state, that could 
probably split the baby, if you will, and um, and, and allow this community to move forward, but uh, maybe somehow preserve some some types of uh, merits of this uh, that will satisfy some folks uh, on the commission that uh, are currently not uh, able to support it. Um, uh, and I'll stop there and see if anybody would be willing to entertain any type of amendment uh, to move us forward. Thank you. Commissioner Vargas, I'd just like to direct your attention to the correspondence tab on the staff report. There is an amending uh, motion. I think it still needs some work from Land Watch. It's probably, I don't know, about 10 pages or so into the correspondence tab on the website. And while you take a look at um, look at that, you can pull it up. There's a letter dated July 6, 2017. I'm going to recognize Commissioner Brownsey, and then uh, there are a number of other commissioners that would like to speak. I think I would like to support an amending motion. Um, I think the information from council to me was very interesting about the answer to the question to Commissioner Leveno's question regarding inheritance. That, that, that troubled me, and I forgot to ask about it, but I'm so glad that Commissioner Leveno did. Uh, I'm also hearing what uh, Commissioner um, Padilla stated, and I think that in my mind with these comments and in light of what Commissioner Vargas just said, I'm wondering if there is a, another way. Um, and perhaps um, Commissioner Padilla, I'll defer to him, but perhaps the, the, um, the middle ground uh, of what Land Watch is suggesting. But then I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, I am going to recognize Commissioner Schellenberger. She hasn't had an opportunity to speak. And then I will get back to you, Commissioner Padilla. Hi. Um, this is a very, uh, the testimony has been extraordinarily emotional and personal and um, I think everybody up, up here it has been very moved by it. Um, I also believe that we must base our decision, however, in the Coastal Act and in our standard of review, which in this case is the Monterey County uh, LCP and LUP. So um, it can be very difficult to set those uh, um, very personal and emotional <coughs> stories aside. Um, and having said that, I would resist trying to uh, find a middle ground here. Uh, I think it's important that we, each one of us, base our vote on how we read the Coastal Act and how we read the uh, consistency with the, with the um, LCP. If this were to go down, it's not, it's, it's not like a... Um, uh, large hotel development that's before us that it you know this would allow uh, staff and these people uh, to continue to work towards something which can be grounded in the law which governs this body um, but I will strongly resist unless somebody has a, a middle ground that I have not envisioned myself I don't think this is the time to uh, rewrite uh, both the proposal and the findings that would come behind that action. So I would urge us to vote on what's before us. Um, I, I don't know. How, I don't know where the vote slides, but if it were to go down, it would not be the end of working on this issue. It's just this isn't a proposal that meets our standard of review. Uh, prior to recognize recognizing Commissioner Padilla, I would like to say a few things. Um, in looking at this, I think one of the challenges that, that we have is that we are looking at um, a strict interpretation of the Coastal Act. And one of the things that I think that when you're dealing with um, human beings and you're dealing with unique circumstances, um, you have to allow uh, some room for some creativity. 
I don't think that that necessarily means setting a bad precedent under the Coastal Act. In this case, we heard from staff uh, who indicated that they had not, and, and you can chime in if, if I'm mischaracterizing you, um, but they had not ever seen a case um, in, in their uh, research where you had a clause for affordability in perpetuity um, and that um, this was a unique case in that uh, we heard testimony that 60% or two-thirds of the construction, um, the, the construction uh, labor was performed by the homeowners. And so this is a different circumstance, I think, than if you have an affordable housing developer who uh, stands potentially to make a profit on this uh, without having that individual sweat equity um, uh, added to a project. And I would just like to remind, you know, I don't know where this vote's going to go, but I would just like to remind us that uh, in 2016, the legislature passed AB 2616, authorizing the California Coastal Commission to consider environmental justice issues in its permit decisions. And it gives the commission the authority to consider environmental justice as defined under state law to uh, consider um, environmental justice or the equitable distribution of environmental best benefits throughout the state. And under the California government code, environmental justice is is defined as the fair treatment of all people, excuse me, the fair treatment of people of all races, cultures, and incomes with respect to the development, adoption, implementation, enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And so while I appreciate the discussion of the Coastal Act and the following of the terms of the Coastal Act, I think we also need to think about uh, some of the things that the audience was mentioning. Are we um, supporting justice? Um, are we um, supporting equity? Is this fair? And so I think that uh, when we make our decisions, we don't necessarily have to establish a precedent because of the unique circumstances of this case. And so I would just like us all to uh, think about those things as our staff now starts to incorporate principles of environmental justice into our regular decision-making process. And in this case, it, it may be, you know, it, it's unclear where that comes out in the balance, but I think it at least needs to be part of the discussion. And, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Commissioner Padilla. Thank you so very much for a tremendous job, Madam Chair, and the eloquence there. And I would generally agree, uh, but to the, to the point of the discussion, procedurally, uh, uh, my own two cents would be that in a perfect world, not don't throw anything at anybody, but this is my opinion, respectfully, to Monterey County, I mean, this really should be an LCP evaluation for amendment to deal with this in a fundamental and, and lasting way. Uh, I would agree with Commissioner Schallenberger that we don't want to be, I mean, too often ad hocing, piecemealing uh, controversial CDPs together on the dais on the fly. When we've been all avoided, I would note that I did review the letter from Landwatch and their motion, as I understand it, is essentially to delay this for 90 days to give the parties a chance to basically reach a compromise. I don't, I don't, I would be interested in, in uh, staff's uh, take on the impact of that recommendation and how it might apply here. Having said that, just real briefly, I just want to let know, look, I'm a, I'm a, you know, soy Latino. I'm a Latino LGBT guy that grew up in a poor neighborhood in South Bay in San Diego. And I have relatives that march with Cesar Chavez, okay? So I, I have a good sense of environmental justice and I, and, and of equity. And, and I, I, I have not, I don't just theoretically uh, subscribe to those. I've lived those issues and challenges in my life. Uh, I just would respectfully disagree that I think they are necessarily the issue here uh, or the one that is really before us. Uh, and I think that while this particular project is very unique um, in terms of its circumstance and how it came to be, the evaluation of such a project for affordable housing on site in the coastal zone and relying upon a certified LCP whose language is pretty unambiguous is not at all unusual. In fact, it's pretty consistent with what, in my opinion, 
the standard of review should be. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other commissioners desiring to speak who haven't had an opportunity? Seeing none, uh, was there an interest in an amending motion or shall we take the motion? Looks like we will be voting. Um, the maker of the motion and the seconder have asked for a yes vote. Uh, Vanessa, could you please call the roll? Commissioner Brownsey? Yes. Brownsey? Yes. Commissioner Groom? No. Groom? No. Commissioner Howell? No. Howell? No. Commissioner Luevano? Yes. Luevano? Yes. Commissioner Padilla? No. Padilla? No. Commissioner Peskin? No. Peskin? No. Commissioner Schellenberger? No. Schellenberger? No. Commissioner Uranga? Yes. Uranga? Yes. Commissioner Vargas? Yes. Vargas? Yes. Vice Chair Trumbull Sanders? Yes. Trumbull Sanders? Yes. Vote is tied. And um, Mr. Pedersen, could you announce the result of the vote and its effect? A tie vote means that the motion fails. The Kozlak requires any action uh, to receive a majority vote if the commission is present, and a tie is not a majority. So the motion fails. Esto se debe de regresar, pues lo que, lo que votamos hoy era uh, haciendo un análisis de la política del condado. Y ahorita el politica, por la política del condado está escrito que, que tiene que mantener estos, estas casas y estas viviendas en, per, en perpetuidad. Entonces lo que sugeremos nosotros es que deben regresar al condado a donde ustedes tuvieron éxito y que, que luchan ahí para cambiar esa política. Y así, cuando regresan a nosotros, eso sí lo podemos apoyar y, y podemos buscar más votos para, para que ustedes tienen, pueden merecer lo que, lo que, lo que o, pueden, pueden completar lo que merecen. Se tiene que cambiar la regla. Y cuando se cambie eso, entonces ustedes van a tener más éxito. Y hasta eso, nosotros lo podemos evaluar con, con más, uh, uh, con, con más, este, uh, bueno, con más éxito, con, con más análisis de que ahora que ya el condado ha cambiado sus reglas, nosotros ya estamos de acuerdo con esas reglas y todos, y todas se arregla y se va bien, pero va a tener que ustedes seguir la lucha con el condado para que ellos cambien esa regla de perpetuidad. ¿no? Que eso es lo que nos está, es está deteniendo todo. Es, es el arreglo del condado, no de, no de nosotros, sino del condado. Si lo cambian ahí, aquí se cambia todo. Seguimos adelante. Yo, yo sé que es como, se parece como complicado y, y injusto, pero desafortunadamente así, a veces así es el gobierno. ¿no? Pero, ¿cuáles son los originales que con, construyeron estos con sus manos? A ver. Todos. Bueno, ese, esa lucha fue difícil también, ¿verdad? O sea, ustedes tienen experiencia con, con obras difíciles, ¿ok? Entonces, no paren, no paren de pelear. Uh, con... Hay que seguir adelante. Hay que seguir adelante. La comunidad se tiene que mantener unido con la lucha. ¿Okay? Y cuando regresan, vamos a estar aquí para seguir apoyando. ¿Okay? Esperamos. Ya de los que nos apoyaron, y un buen por los que no. para ver dónde estamos todos lo que pasó es que 
se hizo una moción para que se apruebe el cambio hubo una segunda y luego empezaron a comentar qué pensaba cada quien el resultado final fue que cinco votaron en favor y cinco en contra entonces la moción no pasó y al no pasar pues es, no se cambió esa es, esa es la mala noticia entonces estamos digamos igual lamentablemente ahora tenemos que ver las opciones que hay y como dijeron los comisionados esto no está terminado hay no, las luchas son largas la lucha sigue si ustedes quieren porque ustedes nos van a decir si sí, si sí, he estado con ustedes y va a seguir estando hasta donde ustedes quieran si quieren luchar no sabemos cómo luchar y la lucha no es fácil la lucha nunca nomás se hace de que lo que quieres ya te hacen lo que tú quieres no, la lucha es, es pesada y a veces tenemos que hacer más sacrificios y la lucha es de sacrificio no es de le ah, no me pongo ahí, les doy una bonita historia y los convenzo a una gente de un corazón muy duro. Y ya lo miraron. Un latino que aparentemente debe entendernos mejor, sale que no, que no nos entiende, tiene otra forma de pensar y fue el que empezó a voltearse en contra de los demás. Entonces, ok, ¿nos vamos a cruzar de brazos por eso? No. no. Ok, ¿vamos a seguir? Sí, okay. se puede. ¿Se van a asustar? ¿Se van a no, desanimar? No. no. Okay. Entonces, tenemos que demostrarles que nosotros no nos vamos a, a rajar. Que nosotros no vamos a dejar la lucha por ese voto negativo de unas personas que, en mi opinión, tienen mucho de racismo dentro de ellos, pero no quieren admitirlo y lo cubren con otras razones. Pues una forma de simular el racismo, porque... No pueden descaradamente destaparse, pero utilizan que esto, que acá y que allá. Pero la verdad es que hicieron un excelente trabajo. Felicito a todos los que hablaron, se aventaron. Man, yo sí hubiera sido yo otra vez interés por ustedes. Y dije, si no votan ahora, ¿cuándo? Hicieron un excelente trabajo, pero como digo, la lucha no termina aquí. La lucha no es fácil, la lucha va a seguir. Entonces, aquí Alfredo nos va a comentar y... ¿Alfredo va a ser con nosotros? Yo sí. Ah, oh, bueno, entonces... Entonces, si Alfredo está con nosotros, las opciones pueden ser las que siguen. A ver, Alfredo, te doy chance, si no lo sigo yo. No, no. Entonces, uh, hablé con alguno de los comisionarios que los uh, uh, apoyó. Y como dijo, Sabino, fue un excelente trabajo que hicieron. Este, una opción que ya lo habían comentado la última vez que nos juntamos allá en Santa Cruz es que en el área del norte del condado hay un plan que se llama Local Coastal Plan. Creo que ustedes escucharon comentarios de las iniciales LCP, LCP, que es Local Coastal Plan. Bueno, ese plan es el plan que esta comisión se tiene que dirigir en términos de cuál es, cuáles son los reglamentos, cuál es la ley, cómo van a ser sus decisiones. Y lo que me han comentado los amigos que tenemos en la comisión, que lo que tenemos que hacer es ir con nuestros amigos en la mesa directiva de, de supervisores, con Luis Alejo, Simón Salinas, este, el sí. supervisor Phillips, que cambien el LCP, ese plan de la costa que pertenece aquí al norte de, de, del condado de Monterrey para actualizarlo porque hace como dos años se actualizó lo que es el, 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 este, la ley estatal de toda la costa pero ese documento del condado no lo han actualizado donde se tiene que cambiar donde ya no tienen tanto autoridad la comisión porque la razón que la comisión puede este, tomar este asunto y, y tener este, esa, esta decisión es porque ese documento no lo han actualizado entonces el plan es de juntarnos con nuestros amigos en la mesa de supervisores y pedirles que cambien ese documento para que el condado se quede con ese, esa responsabilidad y la autoridad de hacer la decisión y no se la tengan que pasar con la decisión. Está claro. Otra opción que me dijo el, el, de la, el, 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 el personal 
sería que chispaga otra solicitud y que, que tenemos que ofrecer uh, reemplazar las unidades. Podría ser otra alternativa que algunos de la comisión podrían este, apoyar. Pero eso no, no lo sabemos. Pero quizás el mejor plan y, y será bueno que nos juntemos con este, los supervisores a ver qué opinión tienen ellos, cuál sería el mejor plan. Porque vamos a tener que necesitar el apoyo de los miembros de, 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 de la directiva de los supervisores del condado. Básicamente vamos a tener que trabajar con ellos de nuevo para ver cómo pueden negociar las cosas donde este, podemos tener este, éxito aquí con, con la comisión. Por lo menos necesitamos tres y creo que, creo que sí los tenemos. Los tenemos porque uno de ellos es el que viene a votar por nosotros y el otro es... Alejo y el otro Simón Salinas. Sí, Simón se Por eso la nosotros. importancia de tener nuestra gente que entienda a la gente en el poder. Y esto nos puede dar la oportunidad de cambiar inclusive esa ley injusta y hacer un movimiento en contra de eso. Y no nomás nosotros, traer más gente y atacar el sistema como está ahorita para que se cambie. Porque estos que estuvieron fregando, que son unos cuantos, son los únicos. Hicieron más caso a tres, cuatro personas y a cientos de personas que vinieron en contra de esa resolución, de esa restricción injusta. Entonces, yo hasta me dan ganas de entrar gritando al padre y a todos echarle un, una gritadera, pero no, no sé. Me dan ganas, me dan ganas de pasar, tú dices. No va a la violencia. No, no, pero pacíficamente no va a la boca para afuera. No va a pasar y decir... Padilla injusto, padilla injusto y entra y salimos. No sé. Quiero tomar esa acción de desquitarnos. Ahí va a estar de modo, pues nos vamos a dejar apoyar. Bueno, ¿nos siguen? Sí. Vamos. Vamos. Vamos a entrar. Vamos a entrar más chido de ese largo. Se me hace mucho ruido. Ok. No. Vamos a estar caminando. Y más caminando y vamos a dar la vuelta por todo en frente de ellos y cuando estemos todos en línea gritamos Padilla Injusto Padilla Anfeo y le damos ahí un mensaje es un trabajo aquí un traidor para la raza ¿Nos vemos? ¿No me y, y quizás ellos van a decir que no es por ello no es por el